Well, I have two, they're probably about nine months old. So <laughs> they might cause some havoc. Excellent. That's good. Yeah. We, we need that. Welcome folks who are just joining us. We're going to wait a couple minutes before we get started. Thank you for being here. Yay. <laughs> hello from Latvia. Hello <laughs> to Latvia. My friends from Latvia are over there. Oh my goodness. Yay. Yeah. Two fabulous artists are actually going to be part of the Venice Biennale upcoming oh. in a couple of years. They're representing yeah. Latvia. So thank you. Oh, that is very exciting. Yes. Latvia in the house. Yay. <laughs> And um, and you've got a comment about your glasses. Yeah, I think they are fabulous glasses. You know, it's that, it's that age. <laughs> it's caught up with me. But I do like my glasses too. Thanks. They're great. <laughs> well, why don't we go ahead and get started and we'll do the intro and folks will continue to join. Um, hello and welcome everyone. I'm Karen Kinzel, the director of the Palo Alto Art Center, and I'm delighted to have you all here today for our final artist talk in conjunction with our exhibition, Where the Heart Is. Um, this exhibition actually closes tomorrow, so if you haven't had a chance to see the show, I highly encourage you to do so. So we're open tomorrow from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. I want to thank all of the members and supporters of the Art Center Foundation who made this exhibition possible. Also, our funder, the National Endowment for the Arts, who made uh, these art artist talks possible. Um, and once again, thank you all for being here. So uh, Lian Trong was born in Saigon and actually grew up in Santa Clara, a great little local connection. Her practice examines cultural and political ideologies and the visual and material hierarchies intertwined in the formation of histories and belief systems. Her work has been presented in exhibitions at the National Portrait Gallery, North Carolina Museum of Art, Station Museum of Contemporary Art, the Weatherspoon Art Museum, the Oakland Museum of California, Art Hong Kong, Sea Focus Singapore, Southern Exposure, um, Turner Carroll Gallery, Patricia Suito Gallery, um, and she was a recipient of a 2019 Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant. She's received fellowships from the Institute of Arts and Humanities and the North Carolina Arts Council and residencies at the Oakland Museum of California and the Marble House Project. Reviews and mention of her work are included in Art Asia Pacific, the San Francisco Chronicle, Houston Chronicle, Oakland Tribune, New American Paintings, and Art It Japan. Uh, Trung is an assistant professor of art in the Department of Art and Art History at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We are so delighted to have her included in the exhibition and are just so excited to have her with us this afternoon. So thank you, Leanne. And she'll be taking questions at the end of her talk. You can unmute yourself for that or put questions in the chat. Welcome, Leanne. Great. Oh my gosh. Well, Karen, thank you so much for that amazing intro. I just wanted to say that I am so um, thankful and I'm so excited to be part of this exhibition. Um, so thank you to you, Celine, and the whole uh, staff at the Palo Alto Arts Center. And I also want to thank Patricia Suito, who um, who I work with in San Francisco and represents my work and is just a fabulous cheerleader for my practice. Um, I also, I want to say, Karen, I think I sent that, um, I don't know when I sent that, that bio, but I actually received tenure, so I'm now an associate professor. <laughs> so, so yay, yay, yay. Uh, so anyways, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing that happened last year. Um, well, thank, I want to just thank everyone for being here. Again, it's so wonderful to see so many names from different parts of my life. And, you know, uh, right now being, you know, we're all in the pandemic um, through social media is a way that I, I continue to connect with you all. And I'm really thankful for that. And so I'm going to share my screen and I have a PowerPoint. Um, I do have some notes. I'm trying to cram in actually quite a bit of information. Um, one of, you know, my practice, my painting practice really looks at the lineage of painting philosophies and, and um, really a lot of it is a critique um, of the art and painting canon and sort of how the, these canons are restricted to a very narrow um, lens, right? And so to, to make sure that I'm also addressing the moment, you know, um, looking at ways in which these narratives of, of hegemony 
permeate um, our ideologies, I'm, I've really kind of inserted some additional um, things that influence my practice in here, you know, to address the moment of Asian American hate and racism that we're seeing today. So I will go ahead and let's see if I, let me see, I'm gonna open up my PowerPoints here and share my screen and then I'll get started. Okay, can everyone see my PowerPoint okay? Let me put it on slideshow. Okay, wonderful. Great, looks good. Okay, thank you so much, Karen. Great. So, um, so I I wanted to start with a foundational text um, of of, of post postcolonial studies, and this is Edward Said's Orientalism. And uh, you know, quite a few of you are probably um, well versed with this text, but it's a text that has really influenced my practice. And within it, it's very dense. Um, um, but there there are there are a couple of, of concepts that are really core to my practice. Number one is that within Orientalist concepts, definitions of the East have changed throughout history, meaning Africa, the Middle East, and or Asia, and how within Orientalist concepts, um, these cultural and political misrepresentations are created in the West. And for myself as a painter, I'm really looking at how things such as paintings and monuments are artifacts of cultural heritage that are made um, and how these misrepresentations perpetuate hegemony and that, that continues to permeate our belief systems. Okay, now I just have to figure out how to, hold on, I have to move this bar real quick. Okay. So um, within, this is an example of, um, of, of French Orientalism right here. And so, and so um, a, a, in a lot of these paintings, we, we see things such as the harem and the obelisk, and they were really created for the male European lens, and they were fictitious representations of the Asian female body um, in some very submissive and sexualized forms. Sorry, I'm having issues here, there we go. Um, and one of the things that's really interesting here, and we think about these nude bodies and, and sort of their prominence within Orientalist paintings, but in the 19th century in America, it was actually not nude bodies, but cloth that was used to portray Asian women as sexualized. In the case of 22 Lu Chinese women, which it was a case that began in 1874, um, an American steamer named SS Japan that carried almost 100 passengers from China docked in the San Francisco Harbor and the California Commissioner of Immigration, himself an immigrant from Poland, denied permission for 22 women, ages 17 to 22, to, to disembark, citing they were lewd. The case went all the way to the US Supreme Court and eventually ruled in the women's favor. The women were not married and not accompanied by family. Testimonies from mostly white men used the women's clothing and adornment to make inferences that they were prostitutes citing colorful silk clothing, ornament, and headdress, we need to consider that skin, cloth, or and ornament can only become interrelated metaphors for personhood when actual personhood is ignored and invisible. And so I started to, um, I was really interested in embarking on narratives about the complication of these global and transnational identities and also respond to the issues of historic figural representation of the imperialist and orientalist paintings that I showed. And also how like just maybe the representation of a figure is limiting to talk about how complicated these identities are. So I turned to the worldwide textile trade itself for centuries has been a narrative of migration and hierarchy and power. So for here, we can see on the left side, a French textile from the late 18th century that was used for import into Africa for slaves. And on the right, we see painted silk from Asia adorning the bodies of high society in France, Britain and America. Um, textiles also were also used to perpetuate supremacist narratives. And so here is the 18th century scenic textile, which showed how Europeans personified Americas at the Americas as an exotic native woman, and also became a symbol of Spain's dominance in its American colonies. The textiles also show, these historic textiles also show, perceive, how the perceived representations of culture have changed through cultural contact complicating the ideas of cultural signifiers of identity born from endless border crossings, colonialism, war, and political and social conflict. In the 1940s, scholar Fernando Ortiz from Latin America put forth a concept of transculturation, 
It's a new political theory of cultural contact, one that's not define itself only in oppositional relation to the histories of colonial dominion. And in this intermingling of different peoples and cultures, he stated that new cultural phenomena are born. So it's with Ortiz's transculturalism in mind that I created on this, um, this series, which I really wanted to, to kind of create a new kind of narrative. And in these narratives, I abandoned traditional figuration, representing the figures through the gesture only with my, from my hand and body, and then I adorned the painted textiles with designs from specific time and region as a type of patriotic uniform. I was really interested in the expansive interpretation of painting and not to perpetuate monolithic ones. So for instance, my gestures are not about the individual artistic ego as in Greenbergian mid-century abstract expressionism. Instead, I was really interested in the Asian painting tenet to capture the essence of a subject, not simply to represent. So the essence here that I'm trying to capture is the essence of assimilation, erasure, and birth in the creation of transnational identities. I also began to use silk and linen as a reference to the, these traditional painting supports found in historical painting traditions and methods out of the lineages of Europe, America, and Asia. I was also referencing the Silk Roads, the first location of cultural, religious, and material exchange between the Mediterranean and China. This is the last of the series, um, and it became a much more personal um, painting for me. So the textile designs are from 18th century American, Southeast Asian, and Sioux Nation. My status as a refugee from Vietnam was a country colonized for centuries into the status as an American citizen, a country founded on the colonization and genocide of indigenous tribes. This is also the first time I'm referring to landscape. Um, there is um, on the very uh, top left there an interpretation of Thomas Birdsap's Yosemite, an early American landscape. And within, within this work, I, um, they were part of Birdsap's work as part of the early American landscape paintings of the Hudson River Valley School, um, which became entwined with early American ideology. So in, in my work, I began to dig, dig deeper into the theories of the HRV school. In his book, Imperial Landscapes, from John Crowley, he states, we need to consider that landscape painting is a fictitious and constructed space. Thomas Jefferson, in his notes from the state of Virginia, called on American landscapes to be viewed through the lens of British aesthetic theory. Britain's, and this is an example here of Britain's sugar plantation colonies, painted by Thomas Hearn. In this landscape is represented as peaceful, the empire's subjects through the eyes of, through the, eyes of the colonizer. Renaissance's invention of linear atmospheric perspective creates a vast colonized space. And in the foreground, completing Hearn's account of the social hierarchy is the stereotype of indolent slave. So um, as I dug deeper into the theory of British aesthetic landscape, I, I came across Thomas Cole, who was actually the founder of the HRV school. Um, I'm sorry, HVR school, um, HRV school. So he was an English immigrant and not an imperialist. Um, but during this time period, given the romanticized aesthetic this, and the symbolism, the school became linked to American Manifest Destiny. Um, and so he created a work called um, The Course of Empire. And in this, in this very moralistic narrative of actually five paintings, even though I'm only showing four here, he shows the rise of civilization from its savage state, complete with the depiction of indigenous people, to its fall. So um, I also recreated these five paintings. Um, and so within this, this time period here, um, I, like I'm showing you the, these moralistic narratives, but for my own work, um, sorry, I'm kind of having an issue forwarding here. Um, I really wanted to create narratives that engage in this kind of syncretic blending. So here I'm using Chinese shifting perspective, which, which, which is a painting tenet and a philosophy that breaks free from the restrictions of time and place, Think, linking the idea that perspective is mobile and in flux. And here is an example of both very traditional um, 17th century uh, Chinese uh, shifting perspective, and then Li Huayi, who's a contemporary painter. I also really wanted to reject the romanticized aesthetic of the American and British landscape paintings. So um, I, I really loved and found um, a connection with the frenetic compositions of Japanese war prints. 
And so in my own work, I'm re revising Cole's Empire, examining the political conditions embodied in Amer the America's founding agrarian philosophies as a nation built from colonization, diverse immigrant groups, and slavery. The work becomes a frenetic amalgamation built on the previous body of work I just showed you with the gestures and textiles, including American Asian painting materials, philosophies, and techniques. Um, I, you know, within this work, I'm really developing a form and a language that mirrors my own experience. I'm also testing the art historical hierarchies of science of such cultural forms. Um, and, and within this, I have like, you know, romanticized landscape painting. I have the gestures with the textile designs. I have hanging silk painting, which you see here, amongst other things. Um, within Thomas Cole's work, mountains were really um, prominent and symbolic in his paintings. And so with this work, I have the Devil's Tower on um, the very upper right there, which was the first um, American national monument named by Theodore Roosevelt, which is also a sacred site to, to indigenous tribes. So um, here's, here's a really close up here. So you can see there's some painted gestures. There's a figure there. All of this back here is oil. Just, you know, sometimes it's kind of hard to see within the paintings themselves. Um, and then I have, I mean, I have painted silk that I've actually cut and singed the edges of that I've, I've um, put um, hanging in the middle there. And the themes include um, here Dakota, the Dakota landscape from the Dakota pipeline protests, the lynching of Americans, and also dogs, which have been used historically in America to hunt down and terrorize people of color. Here's a close up of the bottom right of the painting. And here we see, and um, this is oil, and then there are dying salmon that is painted on silk textile that's cut and singed and attached into panels. French philosopher Michel Foucault defines this concept of heterotopias as a non-hegemonic space of otherness, which simultaneously mirrors, distorts, and inverts other spaces within a culture. And according to a third principle of the heterotopia, it's capable of juxtaposing in a single space several role spaces and sites that are in themselves incompatible and foreign to one another. Foucault gives an example of the ancient garden in the Orient as a heterotopia that represents a microcosm of the first environment. So this is my take on Cole's um, pastoral or Acadian state. And really in his work, he has a figure which is like drawing in the dirt, which is the beginning of civilization. Um, so in my work on the upper left there, I have uh, the home of Thomas Jefferson Monticello, our intellectual founding father, his home built on a mountain by slaves. And then here we have the Dismal Swamp, which is a, a landscape, a, a, a site between North Carolina, where I'm at, and Virginia, in which uh, the, um, slaves and maroons in the Seminole Nation went to hide away um, within American history. And here's a close-up, as you can see, um, of some of the gesture in the silk painting. Um, I'm also showing um, within all of these paintings, you know, contemporary phenomena, contemporary experiences also. So on that hanging from the kind of sharp Confederate flag depiction are ropes and monuments. So in North Carolina a few years ago, um, there was some significant activism which pulled down Confederate monuments in both Durham and Chapel Hill, where I live. So in Cole's destruction, I focus on the plight during World War II, where the government confiscated the homes, businesses, and belongings of around 120,000 Americans and put them in internment camps in the desert, which was deemed for their own safety. Tapping into this antiquated lineage of yellow peril racist ideologies, which was used as far back um, to encourage European empires to invade and colonize China and also the Greco-Persian Wars. So in my own rendition here, um, it's a destruction is the time that I felt was when America destroyed itself. So the mountain in the back there is from the Hiroshima bomb cloud, and on the bottom I'm painting a very faint uh, landscape of the Manzanar internment camp. As I go closer to here, you can see references to also some portraits which um, also show the complication of Asian American identities and histories. So I have Fred Kuromatsu, um, who was a Japanese American who refused to enter the internment camps and the Supreme Court ruled, ruled against him. 
Um, this work was shown in a solo show in Gallery Quinn in Vietnam. So I just want to show some of these for scale. And they were also shown with these little miniature paintings, landscape paintings up here, which I'll, I'll also talk about. And here's a, here's a close up of that pink painting. So here you can see um, oil painting, uh, pattern gesture, textile design. Here there's hand hanging silk that I painted and hung. And then here there's linen actually that I've, um, that I've printed um, with historic textile design uh, within these uh, gestures of Roy Lichtenstein's um, series, I like his shapes of, of brushstroke series. Um, so, so within this work, um, I started to really kind of dig deeper into, into the set of theories of landscape painting. And I came across the work of John Constable, who was an 18th century um, uh, British landscape painter. And he states, it will be difficult to name a class of landscape in which the sky is not the chief organ of sentiment. So um, I, I started to make, make work and I wanted to interrogate the idea of sky as a sacred place in the lineage of painting to a terrible space in the, in the, the experience of war. And this is actually a, um, part of a photograph that is really um, well known that emerged out of the American campaign in Vietnam, military campaign in Vietnam, known as Napalm Girl. And so um, I've taken her out, but, and this is only- Oh, okay. Um, so um, th this also comes to Stuart Hall, a, a, a writer who states that there's issues of representations that occur when the one body, when bodies are only represented as one kind in the media, because Vietnam is not a war. So um, in Stanley Carnow, sorry, let me something happened there. Stanley Carnell, in his book, Vietnam, A History, draws connections between Walt, women, Walt Whitman, whose poetry calls for America exporting its happiness and liberty to the ancient cultures of Asia, to Kennedy and Johnson, who were probably influenced in Whitman's ideologies and considering action in Vietnam. So I created a series of small landscape paintings, which I titled Translatio Imperii, which draws upon this antiquated idea that civilization is always carried forward by a single dominant power and the historical succession was a matter of outward movement. So I was looking at the relationship between American painting and the Cold War. So I, I came, I, you know, lashed onto Lichtenstein's brushstroke series, which is nod to a mid-century mid American abstract expressionism. <clears throat> and in, during the Cold War, the CIA promoted American modernist artists for 20 years, using them as a cultural weapon in the Cold War pitting the free artistic expression of the abex painters to opposite the Soviet socialist realism perpetuated that they believe perpetuated communist values. And, it, and as far as, you know, painting as being a, a painter, this became, you know, uh, really tied in with the ideologies of World War II. So um, during this time, you know, about 19, in the 1950s, a group of predominantly white male artists that were part of the, the American modernist movement um, went to a place called the club in New York to discuss important concepts such as gen, at, such as Zen. But art critic Clement Greenberg opposed the perceptible link between the abex artists and Asian discourse. In 1955, he wrote, "Not one of those the original abstract expressionists, least of all Klein, has felt more than a cursory interest in Oriental art. The, the sources of the art lie entirely in the West. Not not only was this xenophobic statement untrue, examples of of this thinking likely contributed to the erasure of, of Asian American ab X artists such as George Miyasaki here and Bernice Bing, and also cultivated the ways in which the art canon and, and its political machine created the white male creativity as the historical measure of American greatness. So in this, these new works, um, I started looking at American bombings um, in the world outside of World War II. And so to public record, America has bombed at least 33 countries in public record <clears throat> after World War II, and only one, which is Yugoslavia, isn't located in the regions and countries deemed the collective East by Edward Said. Um, and so I sourced the images um, locating the, the year of the bombings and the, the country's locations. And so I'm painting these painted uh, bomb landscapes 
in the aesthetic of early American landscape painting through the window of one of Lichtenstein's brushstroke series. Leading up to the American Vietnam War, Vietnam had a dilemma in that it was colonized by China and France for centuries. Struggling for independence, Ho Chi Minh wrote the U.S. for aid, starting with Woodrow Wilson to help them throw France out. Ho admired American governance, citing Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence in his Declaration of Vietnamese Independence from France in 1945. The U.S. ultimately supported French colonization, later deciding to pursue military action in Vietnam under the intention to contain communism. <clears throat> During the American military campaign, American General William Westmoreland stated of the region, there are Asians who don't think about death the way that we do. America ended up dropping more bombs in Laos than in entirety on Europe during World War II, making it the most heavily bombed country in the world, a good portion done covertly by the CIA, 80 million bombs which did not detonate upon contact and have maimed or killed at least 50,000 people since the end of the war. These ideologies have also perpetuated dangerous xenophobia on American soil. On January 17, 1989, an armed gunman um, armed with the AK-47 assault rifle killed five young students of Cambodian and Vietnamese descent and wounded 30 more. Refugees in the U.S. who were refugees from the U.S. from the American military campaign in Southeast Asia. This gunman targeted the Cleveland Elementary School in Stockton, California, whose student body was primarily students of color of Asian descent. He talked openly of hatred toward Asian immigrants, believing that they took jobs from native-born Americans, continuing an ideology of dehumanization and invisibility. So this work isn't a critique of the Abek artists. The paintings confront the lineage and canon of historic American painting with the lens that has affected American military dominance in the world. As 19th century British landscape painter John Constable states, in art there are two modes by which men endeavor to attain the same end and seek distinction. In one, the artist intent only on the study of departed excellence or on what others have accomplished becomes an imitator of their works or he selects and combines their various beauties. On the other, he seeks perfection at its primitive source, nature. So in the 19th century, British painter um, John Constable began in 1821 to create paintings from keen observations of the sky and clouds. And he'd established a very distinct painting practice from, from this observation. <clears throat> so um, quoting uh, in, in Nature and Culture on discussion of 19th century American landscape painters, B. Novak wrote, the sky is finally tuned paradigm of the alliance between art and science. In that mutable void, the landscape artist concerns, poetic and ideal and symbolic, empirical and scientific, were sharpened rather than blurred. At the source of light, spiritual as well as secular, the sky relieved absolutism with infinite moods, unchanging ideals with endless process. No wonder the artists fix up their particular attention on those moist cargoes that describe the void and brief but repeated compositions, clouds. Um, I, um, I started collaborating with a friend, an artist, uh, of my, uh, of, an artist friend of mine, Hong An Jung, um, on, on looking more into this idea of American landscape and the military campaign in Vietnam. And we came across um, Operation Popeye, which was a covert operation in which the U.S. used weather modification as a weapon in Southeast Asia. Planes drop seeding agents into clouds, initiating rainfall and extending the monsoon season, making vehicular travel impossible over the terrain. And over on the left there, I just want to read a quote from John Constable. The sun's rays warming first the surface of the earth and their radiation causing warmth to be propagated upward. This warmth converts water on the earth's surface into vapor, which rises and exerts its electrical force on that which the nocturnal decrease of temperature has not decomposed and which therefore remains diffused. The latter, in passing through the atmosphere to give place to that from below, changes in climate arise in the colder air and is thereby decomposed and thrown into a state of visible cloud. And so over here on the, the left, we see the different diagrams of seeding of the clouds um, that the seeding agent created. So within uh, this work, um, I, it's a very large diptych in which I'm painting three stages of, of the diagrams of Operation Popeye. 
and we see the clouds in different states of emergence in a vast landscape. I'm using hard edges, structure, and uncanny color to agitate natural observations between sky and color. And um, this, this work was shown in a cell exhibition up at the Eli Marsh Gallery in an ex exhibition called The Sky is Not Sacred. And here I also have um, the Translatio Imperii paintings. And the video that I can't play because it'll freeze my PowerPoint, which was a collaboration with Hong Man Chung. So within this collaboration, we, we combined footage from the US National Archives, which were airstrikes from 1967 with a narrative by writings of John Constable read by an actor who, who in Constable's text professes an authentic reverence to the sky, suggesting the idealization of nature and science as an aesthetic epistemology. The piece asserts the way in which Western ideologies have violently impacted the Vietnamese landscape and shaped our cultural and emotional relationship to landscape as imaginary space. Um, so this, sorry, I forgot to put the title here. So this is called Patsy, uh, Patsy Matsu Takamoto Mink isn't afraid of the dark. Um, it is, um, you, you'll see the size and the, the references of the next painting, which is the one that's up at the Palo Alto, Alto Art Center now. So this was a body of work that I showed at Patricia Suizu Gallery in 2019. And I was really interested in considering how these fictional landscapes continue to, to be created to perpetuate the white male American myth through role-playing games or RPGs. So I'm painting landscapes within these RPGs in a compressed backward hue into darkness and, and bringing in um, uh, Asian women who have been you know, really uh, significant within American history. So in the middle there, we see Patsy Matsu Takamoto Mink, who's a third generation Japanese American, the first woman of color elected to Congress, who was a representative, uh, representative of Hawaii and co-authored many really important bills um, including Title IX, which ended discrimination, race, color, religion, and sex, or national origin in employment and public accommodation. We also see, it's kind of hard to see here, but upside down heads of Captain James Cook, who was a scientist and explorer, and during his time, like so many which held these titles, also entwined with controversial legacies of British colonialism, including stealing indigenous artifacts. He met his death in Hawaii when he attempted to kidnap the King of Hawaii. And so this is the work that's showing up at the Palo Alto Art Center. And um, that is called Redemption 2, uh, based on the RPG Dead, Dead, Red Dead Redemption. Um, and I have within Silk here the hand, the beautiful uh, hand gestures of Anna Mae Wong, who was an early 20th century Chinese American silent film star, and then also went into voice films too. She worked in a time of prominent yellow face. Um, racism and sexism rose to prominence, even though and even though she not, did not fit the white imagination of the idealized Asian um, female body, she was in cast in limited roles for Asian actresses. She really exuded strength and dignity um, in her, her, her acting and in her art. So here the gestured hands are infiltrating over the landscape within the silk. So this now I'm kind of just really briefly kind of going into what I'm working on now. And so I've um, kind of kind of created a full circle and I'm now working on figurative narrative. And so within this work, I'm really considering the over-sexualized submissive gestures that fulfilled Western imagination and from the historic Orientalist paintings. And so what I'm doing here is I'm taking them, painting them in the palest yellow hue, which you see here, um, and, and, and rejecting their sexualized and submissive origins, recasting them and examining how their gestures can both refer to and reject these oppressive epistemologies. Oh my God, I didn't realize my, my, my screen was so dark. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> um, so here they're given agency, weaponized, weaponized and engaged in acts of self-love. I'm referring to these historic paintings created for and by the Western male lens to acknowledge the real harm perpetuating these mythologies and history of have. And so here they're also, um, they're also interacting and I'm painting um, portraits of Anna Mae Wong that are interacting with them. And this is just a studio shot um, of work that I'm currently working on um, where I'm using Orion, uh, these Oriental figures in the way I've just talked about. And I'm referring to these artifacts of cultural history that have perpetuated these myths of supremacy as, and symbols of manifest destiny as ways that they're enacting legacies of generational trauma. 
So here um, I have also combined them with a, um, a landscape that I painted that's from a historic um, image of, of war and bombing on the Philippines. In Mein Kampf, Hitler praised America as one state that has made progress toward racial conception of citizenship by exuding certain races from naturalization. When Hitler praised American restrictions, he had in mind the Immigration Act of 1924, which imposed national quotas and barred most Asian people altogether. Nazis were more interested in how the US had designated Native Americans, Filipinos, and other groups as non-citizens, even though they lived in the US or its territories. These, model, these models influenced citizenship portion of the Nuremberg Laws, which stripped Ger Ger Jewish Germans of their citizenship and cla classified them as nationals. And the next one will be the last one, and it's very much in progress. So here, one of the things I'm doing here, in addition to painting silk panels, is I've actually started printing um, on the silk these, these historic textile designs. I'm also painting on them. And then I'm creating these kind of anamorphic form, forms in which bodies emerge, um, you know, out of sort of like this historic reference to, to the violence from, from these Orientalist ideologies. So um, they're, all, they're cradled um, by uh, these figures and oil paints, which have their lineage in Orientalism. And so for me, to me, I'm really thinking about with these narratives that I'm creating now, a type of Asian futurism, one that considers the actual violent histories that emerge from these Orientalist ideologies and the trauma strength love that has been absorbed generationally and transcends geographically through the transnational experience to create narratives of resistance and autonomy, autonomy. All right, so that's it. <laughs> so I'll stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julianne. Oh, so much content. And um, at this point, we would love to open it up for questions. Um, uh, there is a, a really lovely comment in the chat. Um, <laughs> Uh, less a question. Um, and uh, I welcome uh, folks to mute, unmute themselves and share their question directly or put it in the chat. Um, I, I'm sorry, can I just say something? And I am so sorry. So like I'm kind of in a dim, dim room. I didn't notice the very end there that my screen was totally low and light. So I hope the images were okay. The images were great. They okay. were lovely. You were fine. Um, I, I so appreciate it. I, I just looking at all of the different layers of imagery, the layers of meaning, the layers of material in your work. Um, one of the things that um, really surprised me, having seen your work in two dimensions um, before actually seeing it here in the gallery, is that the the fabric elements of your piece come alive in the space. Um, so if you're in a space with any type of HVAC system, um, you know, it, they're basically animated in this way that I didn't expect. And it's amazing and kind of hypnotic. And um, it, I assume that they, because the, the fabric pieces are only adhered at, at the top, that that's yeah. a, kind of a, a, an element that is integral to your practice. Yeah, and I'm so glad. I mean, I think that one of the things I, I do want to backtrack and say is like, you know, I feel like for my for my work, there's so much context I want to give. So that's what a lot of my talk is about. But like, I'm a painter. And so when I'm in front, like so much, I don't talk about the, the process and the colors and the materials, you know, through my practice. So I'm so engaged in those things as I'm creating this language. So I really appreciate the question. Yeah, so this, that, um, I know, like I, I was, I remember being told, I think by Gail White, who was also one of my mentors at Mills College when I was an undergrad, she went to my show and at Patricia Sweetown, she said, you need to put videos of your works because they move, you know, and, and like, they're not just static. Um, and I, you know, when I made the work in my studio, I didn't really recognize the first time I showed these works, it was a, a it was an HVAC system, as you say, Karen, that let, I'm like, oh, it's moving. And I'm like, I think I like that. <laughs> and really, you know, to me, the silk, I mean, it's a skin, right? It's a skin imported from Asia, you know, that I'm painting on. And so there's something that's really, I think, interesting about the animation quality as it's, it's added, you know, onto kind of like the, the painting, the kind of oil painting itself. Yeah. Um, I was just, okay, great. So sh I, I see Sharon's question. So does that answer your question, Sharon? Or do you have a specific question about the silk? 
Okay, great. And then I should probably mention that, if, oh, oh, question, good, 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 you go, it's all you. Oh, sorry, yes. Hi, Leanne, how are you? Hi. Good to see you. Jackson, oh my gosh. Can I just say, Jackson and I went to undergrad together at Humboldt State University. <laughs> in high school. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, hi. oh, that's right, we were in high school together. Oh yeah, God. We, uh, we, we, <laughs> and I'm actually, I'm joining from Vietnam right now. I've lived here in Hanoi for 10 years. Yeah. Um, so this is great. Um, I have yet to see the pieces in a gallery, so I loved hearing the um, the, the kind of experiential part of seeing it move and, and the way that, that, that it feels almost animated. And I did have a question about process, actually. Um, I, I was curious, because there's, there's so many rich ideas and kind of deep meaning and references in there. When you create the work, does, does it, in the ideation stage, is it all fully envisioned or you start with some elements and other elements come in while you're, while you're painting? Yeah. Um, I, I, Jackson, I so appreciate that question <laughs> because it's, it's like, it's, I think it's one that isn't clear. So when I, I think that, um, you know, for me starting, you know, up to the very abstracted pieces where I was just dealing with the gesture and, and the, and the, the textile designs and then going into the works that I have, that I kind of read to Thomas Cole's course of empire. Um, there, there was a concept, right? Like I knew I wanted landscapes i know i wanted textile designs right um the way i started the works was sort of like knowing what narrative i wanted to deal with and so from that kind of context there were certain textile designs like different countries and time periods i went that i kind of took right and then maybe there's a couple of landscape images that i i, that I found that i wanted to paint but then it was like creating this like just like gradation of value and then just i had the um the works are quite large so i created my own brush by putting two brushes together. So it's a 16 inch brush. <laughs> and then I just started like creating these big gestures over it. Not, I just not really, I felt like there was like almost like no way for me to, to sketch these out because they were so layered. And I felt like it just had to kind of be built upon itself. So I started with these gestures and then put this, and then just from there I started layering things on and like, you know, um, working in the 21st century means like, you know, a lot of stuff is on my computer. So I have references, a folder is full of references I think I want to put in and, and then just really adapting to colors and abstraction and, you know, kind of finding the relationship between representation and abstraction. Um, and then, you know, and then what feels right, right? As like, as a language, as like the painting language I'm creating, what, what weight feels right, you know, um, as I layer. And then the silk does normally come last. And I think for those big works, I really did, um, those, the silk did, came, did come last. But now as I'm working, like I'm starting to layer over the silk too with oil paint. So now when these new works, I'm kind of more integrating the process. Mm, great, yeah. thank you. Yeah, very yeah. good. Yeah, thanks for the question. And um, and again, like I'm happy, you know, I, I, almost, I almost forget to talk about things like that. So I'm so happy for the question. Thanks, Jackson. It's so good to see you. I can't. Likewise, yeah, I'll catch up with you. Yeah, so Jackson's moving back to the state soon. You know, I know you're really sad to leave it now, but I'll look forward to uh, seeing you either there or here. <laughs> yes, I'm sad that we didn't connect here when you had your show a couple of years ago, and I saw uh -huh. that in the slideshow as well. We didn't make the timing work out. Um, sorry, a really quick follow up, and I don't want to take other people's questions time, but um, obviously you were you were born in Saigon, correct? And you moved yeah. to Santa Clara when you were really young and we knew each other then. So I don't really, you know, we, we, we didn't talk a lot after undergrad just because we sort of went separate ways. So I'm actually, I don't know your personal biography in terms of how often you've come back to Vietnam and when, yeah. uh, how frequently you've done that and to what extent that's impacted your work as well. So I'm curious about- Yeah. Uh, and Jackson, I am so actually happy you're asking this question because I'm also, I know that like in the audience are some of my students, you know, and, and because I also think that this is sort of part of what it goes into, I'm going to go into kind of what in our test, like my relationship with Vietnam, like came out of um, wanting to create an artistic practice in a relationship with Vietnam, with Vietnam that was meaningful for me, right? So coming here as part of the, you know, 1975, as the American military campaign, I was a refugee. And so of course I had family in Vietnam and in 1995 and 1997, I went to visit them. And this was, you know, like, like uh, 
devoid and away from any kind of art practice, right? So I was not an art major or anything at the time. I was just, you know, like me, you know, going to Vietnam and seeing family, which is its own amazing experience. Um, but the, I knew at, after I became an art major and after I got my MFA, I just really wanted to cultivate more of a relationship, um, you know, with Vietnam. And, and I think that, you know, the ties for me, the familial ties were significant, but I was part of a, you know, I also, um, Beth Gates um, and, and Jeff, who, who had this wonderful gallery in Oakland at the time, they brought artists from Vietnam over and I got to meet them. And I was also part of a show at um or at in the Huntington Beach Art Center and that was the first time I met um there was like five Vietnamese artists from Vietnam and five Vietnamese American artists and and I met uh Quinn Pham who was is the owner of Gallery Quinn um who is a, a thriving gallery now in Saigon that I work with but I I started I wrote her and I wrote like to to this nonprofit yeah you know, this kind of artist run space in Hanoi like in 1997 or what was it in 2005 and I was like I propose to have shows there, you know? And so for me, like, I really want to cultivate that. I really want to cultivate my relationship with Vietnamese artists and get to know their practice. Cause I think that there was a similarity. Like we were, even though we were dealing with very different things in, in our lives, right? Because of our geographic location and really our biographical narratives because of that, like there was this similar kind of world ideology that I connected with. And so it was really important for me to do that. So because of that, I've probably, uh, you know, gone back to Vietnam like every two or three years to have shows or to do research or something. And, and it, it has actually become more like art. And I see some family for sure, but, you know, it's, it's a beautiful time where I get to connect with my artist friends, you know, in Vietnam and also keep up with their practices and worldviews, which I really, really appreciate. Great. Yeah, thanks. Cool. <laughs> okay. Yeah, any other? Oh, I uh, Tama, Tama, thank you for, I see a really nice comment there. Yeah, so Tama, okay, so <laughs> those last work, so I was supposed to have a show, Tama was a, is the director curator at the Horace Williams House in Chapel Hill, and I was supposed to have a show there, and um, and because of COVID, it didn't happen, and so yes, those very last works, Tama, are ones that, that we're going to show at your, at your space, so yeah, I'm sorry it didn't happen. Thank you for, for the really nice comment. Any other questions from our audience? We were talking a little bit before the talk started. Oh, yes, we have a question. I'll, I'll go ahead. Great. Hi, it's Valerie Stinger. I was just curious, when you said you go back to Vietnam and you see the artists in Saigon, Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming they're probably your age cohort. Yeah, well, I think that that's a really great question. So I, um, I normally see artists both in Saigon and Hanoi, and they are, um, because I've gone back, you know, frequently. It's like I'm, I probably have been back about five or six times for my for my artistic practice. Um, I, I both my first introduction to those artists were artists in my, you know, my cohort, my age cohort. But then I also have met um, artists a little bit older, right, who were really like the, the precursors and who really um, pushed what contemporary practice was in Vietnam. And then I've also met, you know, become friends with and, and you know, have gotten to know artists who are younger than me, right? So these artists now are working in their, like, in their 30s and their 20s. So so, I mean, it's been, I haven't been back since 2018, but like what's wonderful is each time I go back, I, I, I really, you know, get to see kind of like the upcoming generation and artists who are working now too. I was just wondering, is their worldview similar or do you see differences because of the, you have a, a yeah. by, you have two nations forming your framework and sure. just wondered. Yeah. Yeah, it. yeah. I, I think I think you're asking a really great and complicated question. You know, I I don't think I could definitely Did answer. I that. Picture yeah, I I for sure you know can't answer absolutely you know, but um, I think that between artists, right, uh, between artists of my generation, I think we have very similar ideologies. Um, you know, and, and they, you know, we, I think 
you know, but when we look at the history of artists kind of in the world, you know, um, and for those of us who are in, in, in the field, right, we know that it has been history where artists have, have really been critical of, of politics of the state, right? And so I think that we use that kind of, that kind of lens, that kind of criticality in our practices. And, and, um, and that, that is true of like, artists from different time periods throughout different countries. And so I think that even though our works might not be, you know, critiquing or examining the same thing, we apply the same manners of looking to our experiences, right? So, you know, artists in Vietnam are probably working more within Vietnam and about Vietnamese history, right? Whereas I am working more um, about, you know, American history, so. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. So, so if I could make a comment, my name is Jim, I'm Valerie's husband. Um, I think your, your work is, is very important in the, the stories that it tells, the, the, the history, the, the oppression that you, you actually uh, portray in your works. And I think it's very important and I'm glad you're doing it and, and telling these stories and bringing that forward. Um, I can't help but also think of another artist named Hung Lu who's from China and, and we, we adore her work and it has similar uh, origins in terms of telling history and, and the, the, the ravages of war and, and all of these sorts of things. So uh, I just kind of wanted to make a comment. I don't know if you want to comment on that at all or not. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess you care not on your head because I, uh, Jim, I don't think you know this, but like, you know, I went to grad school um, at Mills College and I- Oh, you did? Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> Lou was one of my mentors. And and I, I will say, and this is, I think many people could probably relate, to, many people probably could relate to this. So when I applied to grad school, I applied to different, places, you know, I got great, you know, I got in Micah and Baltimore and, and other locations, but Hung Lu called me <laughs> to let me know that I had gotten to Mills. And she, I mean, you know, when I was in school, like there was so few, there were so few, I think, I mean, she might've been the only Asian woman, you know, Amer American mm -hmm. The woman that I, I knew of. And so it meant so much to me to go work underneath her. And you're absolutely right. I think her work, you know, it exists as portraiture, but there's, it's, it's so loaded, right? Like to know about where she's getting these, these photographs and what she's doing. It's, it's so, um, such a strong, strong statement and refers so strongly to, to history. So, so what do you think about Mills closing its doors? Oh, Karen and I were just talking about that. We are so devastated. Yeah. So devastated. I think there might be some Mills alumni in the, in this group too. Like, um, you know, Emil, I, I had such an amazing experience there. You know, I worked with Hung Lu, Gail White, you know, Ron Nagel was there, you know, mm -hmm. Catherine Wagner, and Emerge. Like, those were just all such strong, strong professors that really, really furthered my, my practice, you know, and helped yeah. me really kind yeah. of tighten it up. And, and I mean, the, the thing is, I know almost everyone I know that who has, who's been to Mills, like, has, such strong memories and ties and we're all devastated, you know, and, and yeah. also Karen reminded me, I forgot that's also in the wake of the art the San Francisco Art Institute closing also. Oh. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is the, the loss of a great treasure, yes. Yeah, for sure. Well, I yeah. think many remain hopeful that there could be some sort of resolution for Mills um, and, uh, you know, hopefully uh, through partnerships or through some philanthropy efforts, it could be saved. Um, so I, I think this is probably a good point at which to close. I want to thank Leanne for sharing so much of her work with all of us and so much of the background behind it. Um, this has been a really inspiring talk and I'm so grateful uh, to have you part of the exhibition. Thank you. And thank you all for attending and look forward to seeing you all at the Art Center tomorrow for the last day of the show. And then when we reopen in May. Uh, thank you all. And thank you, Leanne. Oh, well, thank you so much, Karen and everyone at the Palo Alto Art Center. And thank you all who engaged with your kind comments and your wonderful questions. I so appreciate it. And stay safe, um, everyone. Indeed. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank great. you, Leanne. Okay. Bye. Bye.